All right, we will now have our second uh, grand prize scholarship winner. I want to switch the resolution. It's right on the TV, so it must be a projector. It's got to be the projector. It's yeah. right on the TV. Uh, I'm going to present some of my preliminary master's thesis research, a little bit of a departure from energy as well as a little bit of a departure from the Northeast. I'm looking at uh, archaeological sites on relic shorelines up at Isle Royale National Park, which is in Lake Superior. So I hope that will be a little fun for you in the morning. It's always fun for me to think about archaeology in the morning. Um, I'm an archaeological uh, director with AECOM as well as a master's student at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, so I had a very short commute today, which I was happy about. Um, just a little bit what I'm going to go through today. I'm going to provide a really, really brief background of uh, the, the sites I'm looking at, some of the geologic history, just what's relevant to the work that I'm doing for some predictive modeling, uh, present some of my research goals, as well as some of the bigger project goals, what I'm hoping the introduction of the GIS system will help with park management and their resources, explain a little bit of the preliminary stuff that I've gotten into, uh, as well as upcoming uh, field verification excavations that I'll be, I'll be doing this summer. So this is Isle Royale National Park. It's pretty much as, as far north as you can go. It's located about 15 miles south of Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, but it's part of Michigan. It's a national park. It was designated in the 40s. It's also a national wilderness, 100% wilderness, so no motorized vehicles. Very little development on the island, really just enough to support scientific um, housing uh, for biologists and archaeologists mostly. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the wolf, moose, predator, prey study that's, that's gone on up there for about 60 years. Uh, that's usually what most, most people know, but there's a lot of archaeology up there too. But generally, it's really difficult to get around. A lot of travel has to be by boat. There's about 400 islands that make up the freshwater archipelago that Isle Royale encompasses. So it's, it's, it's pretty treacherous, pretty dangerous to get around. And uh, that's in part been the reason why there's been not much archaeological work there uh, since some studies in the <coughs> islands, really. Uh, but it has a pretty interesting, unique geologic history. A lot of volcanic activity, a lot of glaciation up there. The end result really is uh, some interesting raw material deposits, so chert that, that people would have made in, in prehistory into stone tools, arrowheads, spear points, uh, knives, those sorts of things, as well as copper. So there's some pretty enormous raw, pure copper deposits up in Isle Royale. Um, there's some pretty, pretty far-flung theories about how it fueled the Bronze Age in Europe and all of that sort of stuff, but, uh, but really the stuff was used locally. Uh, we do see it in the southeastern United States and on Mississippian age sites, so sort of mound, mound sites in the southeast, but 97% pure copper, that meant it can be cold hammered, so people made things like awls and spear points and, and things like that, uh, which you can see up here. Uh, and then I'm just going to touch on this briefly. So I mentioned this is a relic shoreline survey. Some of the geologic processes that make this possible is a phenomenon called, called isostatic rebound. And, and I think the best way to describe it is thinking about a couch cushion. When you sit on it, uh, it gets compressed. And then when you stand up, it, it kind of springs back to its original height. Uh, the same thing happens when you have a glacier, the weight of a glacier on a landform, like a little island. Uh, it compresses under the weight of the glacier. And then as the glacier retreats, it springs back to its, its normal size. So that's what's happening at Isle Royale. So what that means for me as an archaeologist is that archaeological sites that were originally on a shoreline right on the water, maybe 7,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, have been rebounding out of the water and are now located about 10 meters above the shoreline. So it's a really great opportunity to look at the way that people used a shoreline in prehistory that we don't always get to, to look at. Uh, and it creates some pretty distinctive features like beach ridges uh, and perch dunes and wave cut cliffs. 
So the time period I'm looking at, um, the glacier uh, moved off the island probably around 11,000, 10 and a half thousand years ago. Um, I'm looking at a transitional time period, um, from moving from the late archaic into the, the early woodland. Uh, it was a time when people started making ceramics, they started using uh, material from, from other locations, so you see increases in trade and communication with, with other indigenous groups. Um, people are changing the way that they're living, they're moving from a, a hunter-gatherer type lifestyle to settling in villages. So it's an interesting time to look at across the board, um, but particularly in the Great Lakes region and particularly at Isle Royal because not a lot of work has been done here. Um, so these are my these are my research questions. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read them off the slide for you. But basically, what I'm trying to do is see if a series of specific predictive models is better than a general presence absence model, which usually happens with archaeological sites. Uh, and also using the series of those models to look at variation in how stuff gets used through time. So we're late archaic peoples using shorelines differently than than later peoples. So obviously, those ridges would have still been available to people later through time. Um, and then what does this mean in the larger context of archaeology in the, in the Great Lakes region? Additionally, I had some project goals. Um, this is a national park. It, it's remote. It's difficult to get around, as I said. The cultural resources staff don't have a ton of resources or time to go out and do these surveys. They're very time intensive. So one of the things I really wanted to be able to provide to park management staff coming off of this project is a means to have a dynamic management tool, something they can work with, something they can update, uh, something that's going to make their field time more useful and efficient, um, something that's going to reduce the number of negative areas that they're testing in, and it's going to give them the best results. As well as coming up with some sort of set of standard operating procedures for some of the data collection, um, archaeological reporting, and how that gets integrated into their existing geodatabase, as well as hopefully what will be their new geodatabase. Um, I just included this as an example. So one of the things that I did was um, process some, some LIDAR data that was flown in 2004 uh, that hadn't really been, been looked at too closely. And so you can see up on the screen uh, the pocking at the base of the slope there. Those are all copper mining pits. Those are all places where people have dug into the hillside to, to pull out veins of, of pure copper. But the, uh, the turquoise dot up there is the site point for that feature. Um, obviously, you lose a ton of information by not having something as simple as having polygon boundaries for sites. Um, you know, archaeology is really a spatial science, and uh, so losing information like that is really important, especially on a really small island, it's about 200 square miles, looking at really changes in micro topography. So, a, a change like this is, is, is really important. Um, so, I've had to go back and do a lot of data uh, processing to, to get through that, but that's one, of the, that's one of the goals I want to be able to provide to park staff. This is just a little bit of a rundown of some of the data sets I'm looking at. Some of the stuff was available from the park itself, like the LIDAR fly that they commissioned and flew, um, as well as known archaeological site locations. Some of that came from the, from the state of Michigan as well. Um, so the soils and geologic information. Uh, they, the park has really great vegetative cover data, so that was, that was useful as well. Um, as well as some, some geologic work that uh, deals with some of the, the relic shorelines that geologists have identified as well. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the, the pre-processing stuff I've done has been to get the LiDAR into a usable format um, to create a mosaic uh, that I can use as a DEM, um, being able to get the slope and aspect information from uh, so that I can start evaluating some of the variables I'm using like soil drainage, uh, slope and aspect, so flat surfaces, uh, southern facing exposures, um, as well as distance to, to other sites. So I just wanted to throw up a screenshot. Um, this is the final of the LIDAR uh, that we were able to get. As well as one of the, um, the, this is the mosaic <coughs> for um, the aspect. Uh, I've just been able to do a little bit of preliminary stuff, uh, some statistical significance evaluation uh, for my variables. Um, a lot of it's cost distance stuff, so how close were people to sources of fresh water? Uh, obviously it was a lake, but it would have been preferable to be near a spring, um, especially if it wasn't ephemeral, if it ran, if it ran around. Um, so in there. And I just wanted to take a minute too, sorry to skip through that, to talk about uh, what's, what's going to come up, because I'm really excited about this, because I am an archaeologist, so I like to excavate. 
But uh, apart from being able to develop some predictive models and hopefully being able to have valid predictive models, I'm also going to get the opportunity to field verify the models, which, which is pretty exciting. So I'm going to be traveling up to the island for about three and a half weeks this summer with a crew of about 10 archaeologists to excavate some of the high probability and low probability areas to hopefully find sites in the high probability locations and not find sites in the low probability locations. Um, hopefully going to be able to snag a couple of samples for radiocarbon dating. So hopefully those sites correlate with the time periods that I'm looking at. <clears throat> as well as go through artifact identification to try to figure out what materials are being used. Um, and that's going to be a mix of traditional survey, so test pits every 50 feet or, shit or so within these polygons. Um, as well as metal detecting, which will help uh, pick up some of the, the copper deposits there. And hopefully see some of these guys, because I'd, I'd really like to see some moose while I'm up there. And then uh, I just wanted to take a minute as well to thank uh, Energis and GITA for uh, giving me the graduate award. I also wanted to take a minute to acknowledge some of the other organizations that are providing support or funding for me, especially the National Park Service, which have been, which have been great, um, the Anthropology Department and the Department of Geography and Regional Planning at IUP, and uh, I've gotten some, some funding from the Great Lakes Research and Education Center and uh, the George Wright Society, which supports work in, in national parks. So thank you to all of those groups. Um, I think I might just have time for a question or so, maybe not even. Okay. Uh, I want to put my contact information up there. If anyone's interested, um, I love feedback. If people want to hear more about the project or hear more about it when it's a little bit further along, I'd be more than happy to, to share that with you. Thank you.